Hey, I hope you're doing well. My name's Ian, I'm the founder here at EssentialTennis.com where it's my mission to bring passionate instruction to passionate players, just like you. And today we're gonna to be talking about five different topics. Tennis.com, the where it's my first one is how to close out matches. Then we're gonna talk about how to start a match warm and ready. So if you're kind of a, a slow starter, then you definitely wanna stay tuned for that. Thirdly, we're gonna talk about how do you teach a student using more like intuition and letting them figure it out themselves or through analysis? Fourthly, when do you change strategies in a match? When do you pivot and try something different? And fifthly, how do you improve transition volleys? So lots of different uh, topics today, really looking forward to all of them. Let's go ahead and uh, jump into the first one which is coming to us from Scott Brody, who's played a lot of matches here on the Essential Tennis Channel, also the Real Tennis Channel. And his last couple matches, I think he's, he's been a little bit um, disappointed, I guess, with his performance or the outcome in certain pockets of his matches. So he actually left a question and said, the last couple matches I played, I've been marked by great starts, but not so great finishes. I don't think it's my fitness, rather it's in between my sexy ears. What kind of advice would you give to a guy like me? Okay, so Scott, I love the, the question. And in my experience, there's five different things that tennis players tend to fall into these traps when they get close to closing out a game, when they get close to closing out a set, when they get close to closing out a match, these five things tend to pop up. And so many of you watching this, it's gonna sound familiar. Listen to this and look for maybe some kind of pattern where you feel like this has been popping up for you. So number one, common temptation or pattern of players. Oh man, I hate to see Steve lose again or whoever it is. Basically, you're kind of feeling sorry for the person on the other side of the net. And as a result, you take your foot off the gas, you show mercy, and you let them in the door. You let them put their foot you know, in the door and give them an opportunity or an, or an opening. Even if it's just one or like two points, it can totally shift the momentum if it's at exactly the wrong time, which frequently it is at exactly the wrong time. So number one is sympathy. Number two is concern over blowing it. Oh crap, what if I blow this? And again, because you're being careful and you're scared and you're tentative and you're playing not to lose, again, you take your foot off the gas, you play it safe, and you don't mess up maybe, but you, again, open the door, just so even if it's a tiny little crack and you give your opponent an opportunity to jump in and take control of the match. Number three, well, I guess that what I'm doing works because I'm about to close out this game or I'm about to close out this set or this match. What about that tactic or strategy? Or should I haven't tried that yet. And so you have the lead. This is, this is classic. I see this all the time. Players kind of get bored a lot of times and they, they want to mix it up. And as a result, they kind of move away from the thing that's been working. Maybe you feel confident and you feel like, oh, this is like in the bag. And so you try like the drop shot you try the drop shot lob or you try the tweener and you kind of take a little bit of a mental detour even if it's just for a minute or two minutes it can open the door just a crack give your opponent hope give them a little bit of a, of a charge and give them optimism that oh maybe there is an opportunity there and that's a lot of times against a good opponent all it can take to let them back into a match number four well this is in the bag, time for a victory lap. So this is a little bit different. The, the one before was like, ah, let's try something different. Like I'm, I'm getting a little bit bored. This one is like, oh, I, I feel like I'm super confident. This is definitely going my way. And so take a, by take a victory lap, I mean like the player totally ratchets up the intensity, the offense, and it's like time to drive this last nail in the coffin. And because they put their foot down on the gas more, then they increase their chances of making a mistake they go maybe a little bit closer to the lines, you swing a little bit faster, you make a couple more errors, and before you know it, again, momentum, even if it's just a little bit, has slightly shifted in the wrong direction, and things start kind of getting away from you a little bit. And here's the fifth one. This is working, let's turn the dial a little bit further. So this isn't a deviation from the plan, this is sticking to the core strategy or the core plan, and just turning the dial up a little bit. So it's not that this player is getting bored and trying something different. Um, it's not that they're just going like all out all of a sudden and putting the pedal to the metal. But again, it's kind of a, 
a result of feeling confident, feeling solid, and maybe wanting to stick it to him just a little bit more. And it's just easing the foot on the gas a little bit further. And as a result, your margin for error drops a little bit. Maybe your swing speed goes up a little bit and you end up beating yourself. And even if it's just a couple of points here and there, again, momentum is such a tricky thing in tennis, in sports, obviously. But I almost feel like in tennis, especially, where it's one-on-one -on -one or maybe two-on-two -two and you don't have like an outside coach, at least for the time being, like feeding you information and feeding you support and telling you exactly what to focus on, you know, like shot by shot and play by play, point by point. And so it's so easy to drift. It's so easy to float in different directions. So if you've watched Scott play matches, which one of these five do you feel like maybe is happening to him? And by the way, Scott, I, I, I'm sure you'll see this at some point. I feel similarly. I feel like you've totally let opponents um, off the hook. Uh, the match with Mark, the singles match against Mark, I feel like you totally let him off the hook, at least in the, I believe it was the, the first set. And also the, the match against Adam, I, I feel like you had an opportunity. So again, those five. Um, sympathy is number one. I don't think that's Scott. What if I blow this? I don't think that's Scott. Um, I think Scott's like a super seasoned, super experienced, very confident uh, competitor. Well, that works. What about this tactic? I don't see Scott like making like a big deviation, but totally tell me in the comments if you think I'm off base here. And uh, victory lap, I don't, I don't think that's him either. Personally, I, I think it's number five. Uh, Scott loves to play offense. He loves to press. He loves to kind of get in your face and put the ball away. And the challenge with that is if you tip just a little too far on the scale of offensiveness and aggressiveness, if you start pressing and pushing just a little bit too much, even if it's like 5% more than what's really necessary to win, then errors can start to all of a sudden, like just in a 60 second window or like a two minute window, if there's a couple more errors than usual, because there's a little bit more pressing, then you can start to shoot yourself in the foot. And specifically, Scott, on like return of serve, I feel like you've had big, like you've had leads in sets where you've used like your pressing tactics really effectively. But then once you get the lead, it's like you feel it, it looks from the spectator, you know, booth, like it looks like you feel the need to press more and then press more and then press more. But you totally didn't have to because you already had the upper hand, you already had the lead. And all you had to do is just maintain and just stick like exactly at, with the level that you were at. Uh, so hopefully that makes sense. That's, that's my opinion with Scott specifically, since he's the one asking and I happen to have a lot of uh, experience, you know, watching Scott play. But I'll leave it at this for all the rest of you. One of, whichever one of those five you resonate with, one of the hardest things in all of sports is just simply to stick with what's working and only what's working. When you hear interviews with athletes in all different sports, you hear them talk constantly about, oh, we're just taking it like one game at a time. Uh, we're, we're just trying to execute, you know, play by play. And it's like all those like cliches. But the reason why they get repeated so much is because it's absolutely true. You have to stay disciplined. You have to stay focused. And when something is working, just sticking to that and not doing other stuff and not getting distracted and not taking your foot off the gas and not pushing your foot any harder on the gas, all of those different you know, types of mistakes can lead to the momentum flipping and just sticking to what works is a lot of times the hardest thing in all of sports. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, it's a really common uh, thing. I, I hope that that's helpful. Bottom line, like this is kind of what we're trying to be better at is just sticking to the play. All right, moving on to question two. This is another really common one um, that I've heard a lot over the years. There's a lot of slow starters out there, people who just feel like it takes them like a whole set to get going. All right, so from Adam Cherry, <clears throat> I got back into playing about a year ago, having not played much since I left school 25 years ago. I joined a local club last September to find myself this year in the final of both the men's and mixed doubles in the cl club summer tournament. Awesome. Awesome. Nice job, Adam. Some content on how to warm up quickly would be great. It takes much longer than 10 minutes to feel like I'm hitting well. I tend to start with light, short balls and gradually move to the baseline, but I feel tense for ages and don't have the confidence for about four games or so to properly open up on my shots, especially 
on my forehand. Totally relate to this, uh, Adam. So I'm gonna give you five different keys here to starting off as strongly as possible in every match. And some of these you probably haven't even thought of, and other ones it's just gonna be giving a specific routine to follow. So key number one to starting every match off strong is warm up your mind before your body. This is one maybe you haven't thought about before. Uh, different people like psychologically and mentally kind of activate in different ways. And people feel like the most prepared, uh, the most ready. Other, some people need to be really calm and chill and relaxed and kind of, they're kind of best in like a Zen state. And way over on the other end of the spectrum is people who need to be totally hyped up, totally psyched up. And like the higher their energy is, like the better they play. So key number one here, you need to identify, Adam, where are you on that spectrum? And then be really strategic about doing something before your match, whether that's music in your car, maybe podcast episodes, thinking about strategy or like the mental game, maybe an audio book that, that inspires you. There's a reason why you see professional athletes with headphones on all the time, like especially when they're walking out onto the courts or they're walking out onto the field. Maybe they're getting off the, the bus and, and they're like going into the locker room. And you see athletes in all different sports with headphones on, they're mentally trying to put themselves in their most ideal state. And so good performance in a match, totally, it starts with that. And so a recommendation, in case you didn't know, I have an audio podcast. Episode number 252 is Tennis Strategy Cheat Sheet. Maybe you don't want to think about, you know, tactics or like technical stuff, but if you if you like like a reminder on how tactically to start off a match, I highly recommend you listen to that episode. But for you, find out for yourself like what routine puts you in the best mental state. Uh, key number two: warm up your body before you warm up your strokes. So you mentioned in your question ten minutes. Well, that means like the actual like warm up, like the match warm up, and you should have been doing something way before then. So for, for me personally, I like to get to whatever the, the venue is, like 30 to 45 minutes ahead of time, ideally an hour. Like I'd like to just kind of sit, like get there, feel like I'm kind of getting incorporated into like the environment, yeah, get a feeling for the courts, get a feeling for spectators, get a feeling for noise, like from a close nearby highway or you know, like whatever, and just kind of get comfortable in my surroundings. And then probably 30 to 45 minutes before your 10 minute warm up. I mean, you could probably do 15 or 20 minutes and, and that's like the least amount of time I'd recommend. Do some kind of dynamic uh, stretching routine. If you don't know what that is or you don't have one, just go to YouTube and do a search for essential tennis warm up. And you'll see a bunch of videos showing like a specific routine. One of them is called something like warm up fast and effective or something like that. But you have to get your blood pumping. You got to get your heart beating. You've, you've got to ideally break a little bit of a sweat before the 10 minute warm up so that your body is activated. And we've already, remember, we've already activated our mind too. So we've activated our mind. We've activated our, our body. Our muscles are going. Our heart is going. Our, our, our blood is flowing. And then number three, warm up your strokes if possible before the 10 minute warm up. And I totally understand this is, frankly, it's usually not possible. But a couple ideas to think about. Is there a wall close by? Even if that means stopping like in a parking lot a couple miles away from the club or away from the park or whatever, and you just hit a couple balls against the wall. Like that would be a game changer for you probably since you're kind of a slow starter kind of player. Just five minutes of, of hitting against the wall. Ball machine would be fantastic. If you're going to a tournament, then there's other players just sitting around. And maybe there's not a court open but go out to the parking lot and just hit some like soft, short shots back and forth. Or drop and hit some soft, short shots to yourself. Even if it's just like hitting the ball up and down on your racket after you've done your dynamic warm up, can totally make the difference in feeling just comfortable with the racket in your hand. And then finally, and this is like really underrated, do some shadow swings with like footwork, like actual, do your split step, move out to the side, you ever see Rafael Nadal like in the tunnel or like uh, in the like behind the scenes area of a tournament? He's like jumping and sprinting and running and like doing shadow swings. He, you know, now he's way over on that end of the spectrum. 
but try try something like that like you got to do you got to do something it sounds like to get yourself activated and get yourself moving i'm not saying like you need to be a crazy person like nadal and be way over on that end of the spectrum but find something he doesn't have a partner to hit with back in the tunnel, but he's just moving and, and he's swinging his racket, he's moving his feet, he's he's jumping, he's running. Find something that gets yourself like activated physically. Okay, so uh, so that's number three, is uh, warm up your strokes. So we've warmed up our, our mind, we've warmed up our body, we've warmed up our strokes, even if it's not ideal. And now it's time for the 10 minute warm up. <laughs> so most tennis players, just use the 10 minute warm up, and then they wonder why they're like a slow starter. Well, that's not good enough. We've done three other warm ups before the real warm up. That's the way you should be preparing yourself if you really take your results uh, seriously. So, in the 10 minute warm up, this is really key, this is really crucial. 80% of your attention and focus should be on your opponent and 20% on yourself. Now, if you're a slow starter, then you probably tend to go out there and all of your attention is on yourself about, man, I feel slow, like I'm, my feet feel super heavy, oh man, my swing is so tight, my, my racket's like, my strings are feeling stiff and it's like, it's just all me, 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 me. And you totally ignore what's happening on the other side of the courts. Uh, Warm Up Like Sherlock Holmes is the chapter of, uh, the name of a chapter in my book. And it just ba describes basically what I'm going over here, which is that most of your attention should be on your opponent. So you can figure out, you can deduce what are their strengths, what are their weaknesses, how is their movement, uh, what strokes are looking a, a little bit off, where are they missing, how are they missing, mentally, like emotionally, are they looking up, are they looking down. As you gather this information, by the end of the warm up, you should have a simple, deadly pattern in mind might be something totally simple, like hit your backhand cross court because their backhand looks totally uncomfortable. If all your attention is on yourself, then you miss that stuff and then you'll get off to a slow start because you're so self infatuated. Like you're so fixated on everything that's happening on your side of the net and you're just kind of waiting to feel good that you never really you never really feel good because everything is just kind of like stuck in self analysis mode and that's not the way that good athletes prepare that's not the way good athletes are focused when they go out there for competition okay so that's number 4 during the 10 minute warm up warm up like sherlock holmes and number 5 is simply choose to receive if you win the spin don't start off serving if you feel like you tend to be a slow starter Put that pressure on your opponent. It's totally a no-brainer if you if you tend to start off slow. That basically gives you another five minutes of like warm-up. Like your opponent in singles generally, like you're supposed to hold serve. So no big deal if you lose that first game. And there's not really a true advantage, like statistically, to serving first. Like, yeah, sure, if you hold it's one zero but you still have to break serve in order to win the set. Like whether you win first or second, you still have to break your opponent's serve or you go to a tiebreaker. And so whether or not you're serving first or second, it's, it's, kind, of a, it's kind of a fake advantage, <laughs> to be honest with you. Like it's, it's not a true statistical like advantage. Either way, you gotta get to six first and you have to break serve to do that if you're gonna win by two. So don't overthink that whole thing. Just say, I'll receive. And now boom, you basically just gave yourself an extra five minutes of uh, warm up time. So for those of you who start off slow, number one, warm up your mind first. Number two, then warm up your body. Number three, warm up your strokes, however you can, even if it's not ideal. So we just did three warm ups. Now we get to the real warm up. Spend your real warm up mostly with your focus on your opponent and then choose to receive if you still kind of feel like you're a slow starter. I hope that's a huge help, Adam. I totally understand where you're coming from. I've, I am totally on the other end of the spectrum. <laughs> I, I tend to, to start off like with my RPMs like way too high and I have to like calm myself down. And uh, in a, a really pressure like match situation, a lot of times it takes the whole first set or in the past, it's taken me a whole first set just to calm down and relax. <laughs> So I'm on the other end of the spectrum, but I hear this question constantly. So totally understand where you're coming from. All right, next up, move to uh, channel three. Hey, what's up, Mark Sanset in the house? 
Uh, thanks, Math, uh -huh. uh, Thanks, I appreciate your support a lot. Glad you enjoyed the book. Uh, the audiobook is a great thing to just put on in the car, like on the way to your match, by the way. Or my, my podcast is over 300 episodes for free. You can just play in the car and just to be reminded of, of good principles on the way to your match. All right, question three, topic number three. <clears throat> this, is, uh, this is an interesting one. Oh, from Math, uh, Math, aha, uh -huh. hey, what's up? Hey it's, your, hey, it's your question. What is the best way to teach a child a good forehand? On the one hand, just letting a child hit as it comes can lead to lots of bad habits. On the other hand, filling a child's mind with do's and don'ts can take away an intuitive relationship to the racket. Any thoughts? Yeah, definitely have thoughts on this. So here's a key coaching principle. Only give as much information as is needed for a student to be successful. And coaches mess this up all the time <laughs> in both directions. Some coaches just want to show off and tell you everything they know. And you're stopping every two seconds for them to tell you what, what you just did or what you messed up or what you should be doing instead or some story about them, you know, when they played Jimmy Connors back in the day or, or something like that. And so they're just constantly information overload constantly. And then there's other coaches that don't really have anything to say. And I, I've seen over the, I've been coaching over 20 years and I've seen a lot of coaches on both ends of the spectrum where on the other end of the spectrum, the, the coach doesn't really give any like insight or analysis. They're just kind of like a hitter and they'll just toss out like a phrase every once in a while. So, and there's everything in between. The thing is, let me get back to my notes. I, otherwise I'll just kind of keep talking here. So you can make the mistake in both directions. Too much information, too much analysis, too much like insight, and your student will get overwhelmed. And you overly complicate things when you just constantly are giving information, information, information. But on the other hand, if you're not giving any feedback or guidance, if, if you're not guiding the, the way that your student is on their path, then they're only going to end up like with whatever comes natural to them. And whatever comes natural to them might not actually be the best way to move your feet or your body or best way to swing the racket. It would be great if we all naturally did the best thing with our feet and our body and our racket, but we don't do that naturally unless we're incredibly gifted and talented. Most of us are not incredibly gifted and, tal and talented. So the question you need to ask yourself in the coaching coach's position is how much information is the right amount of information. Now, here's the thing, and I, I just touched on this. Every student and every skill is different. So every individual human is a little bit different on a spectrum in terms of giftedness or talented, how talented they are. And every individual skill for each individual human is a little different too. So some players will like grab onto volleys like really fast and intuitively. That same student might totally struggle with their backhand ground stroke. And it just makes no intuitive sense to them at all. So you have to understand that every human is different and then every skill for every human is also different. So let's talk about talent. You could, you could call this coordination. You could call this athleticism. You could call this like DNA, like, you know, what their parents like gifted them with. I guess it's not a gift. It's just uh, luck of the draw. You could call this physical awareness, like whatever, eye-hand coordination. It's a spectrum and it's a huge spectrum. And every player is somewhere different overall. And they're also somewhere different with each individual skill. And so the right amount of information depends on how intuitively they pick up each individual skill. So here's some, here's some examples. So you, you, you've probably all seen coaching on the internet from Patrick Moritoglu. His content's amazing, incredibly well done, and he works with super talented, super gifted. I mean, he's uploaded videos with frickin' Serena Williams. So like basically, he has the, the privilege of very frequently working with extremely gifted players. So this was, uh, I just, I went over to his channel just to take a screen grab of like a, an example. And this is like the, the featured video on his channel right now. So this is a drop shot lesson with ATP top 100 player. You think that player has some talent? 
Uh, yeah, like 1% of 1% of 1% of 1% gifted athlete here. So when you watch that video, I kind of had to laugh. Like to my, when I was going to like do some research for, for this lesson right now, I kind of had to chuckle a little bit because the video literally opens up with Patrick saying, it's like rapid fire phrases. And, and he's like, pretend you're holding a little bird. And he's, he's like, oh, just finesse the ball. And it's all kinds of like cliches that the goal is to just impart some quick, intuitive, like, oh, like light bulb or aha moment to his incredibly, you know, gifted and tal talented student. If you're working with somebody with top 100 in the world talent, you can just use analogies, you can use phrases, you can say it's like X, Y, or Z, and they'll just be like, oh, okay, and they'll just do it right. <laughs> and it's like, it, it makes Patrick look like an incredible coach, which he is, he's an incredible coach. But when you're working with somebody who's that talented and everything you tell them to do, they just magically do it, it makes you look like you're a magician, like on the court. Now, here's the other end of the, the spectrum. Here's a lesson that I had uh, with a 75-year-old student who was about a, like a 3-5 player. So this is somebody who's, who has habits that are older than me. <laughs> this person's been playing tennis for longer than I have, and some of those habits have been sticking around for decades. So do you think I can approach this the same way? Like if this, if this player, if I just tell this player, let's, let's say this player has terrible touch and it's a drop shot lesson. Do you think it means anything to this player? If I, if I'm like, just pr pretend you're holding a baby bird in your hand, you think his habits are just going to magically change and he's going to just start doing it perfectly. Like it doesn't work that way when there's years and years of bad habits. And also like no disrespect to this player, the place on the talent spectrum and like the coordination spectrum and the physical like awareness spectrum is completely different for this player. This person needs much more detailed, nuanced like feedback. They need specifics. They need to be told you're doing this and you need to do that. And this is the way it feels. And let's like take some baby steps here because this is a totally different thing than the way you're doing the way you're used to doing it. So just imagine, you know, for a second, like what if I taught my student you know, like, like Patrick, and I just go with the baby bird, you know, method, nothing would happen. <laughs> like no changes would happen at all. If I'm just over on the other side of the court, I'm just yelling out like, I'll oh, just pretend you're unlocking a, or you're like turning a doorknob. Ah, oh, now you'll hit with topspin. Yeah, no problem. Just, just turn the doorknob. Nothing is going to happen. But what if Patrick taught his student, like I was teaching mine? What if that ATP 100 player wants to like work on his drop shot? And Patrick pulls out the iPad and he starts going frame by frame and oh look at like how the racket's like rebounding and look at here's Federer like doing it. And we spend like a half an hour just like l talking about like technique. It would be terrible. It would be an awful lesson for his student. So I bring out these examples just as like a contrast. Like I I'm just trying to demonstrate for you the spectrum here. It's a huge, huge, huge spectrum. And every student is going to be on a different place on that spectrum, which means you have to tailor your communication and you have to tailor the service that you provide to that individual and to that individual's individual skills. So here's kind of the, the bottom line. Here's the, the process that you should follow. <clears throat> Number one, get a general assessment of athletic ability or talent. So scale one to 10. So where on that scale of one to 10 do you feel like this particular student is in general, like just broadly speaking? Step two, assess how they like to learn. Some people really connect when you give them uh, illustrations or analogies or they're more auditory. Like if you explain it verbally, like it just kind of clicks. Other players need to be moved like physically. That's kinesthetic. Visual people need to see it demonstrated. Maybe they need to hear, like I said, uh, like analogies. Bottom line is humans like to get a little bit of information of all, of all three or all four. And so definitely like give them the best possible chance if they need help. Like if they're a one on the one to 10 scale and like they're no coordination, no athletic ability, like no talent, you got to give them every, like you need to give them a little bit of everything before it starts to click at all. Meanwhile, if they're a 10 out of 10 on the spectrum, 
you might just need to say like one word or one phrase and they just instantly start doing it better and they start moving in the right direction. This is why we start with step one. You have to assess their ability or talent level. So also pay close attention to how like they seem to like to learn. And then thirdly, just try an approach, observe what happens and then adjust as needed. So those are the steps you should follow. And hopefully the examples I just gave kind of illustrate, you know, just kind of paint the picture a little bit of what you should be doing and the way you should be thinking about this. Listen, being a good teacher is just as much art as it is science. Yes, you need to know the mechanics. You have to have like the, the textbook like knowledge. The information has to be there. That's the science part of it. But it's equally art how and when and where you dole out that information is just as important as having the right information. So I, I hope this is a, a really big help. All right. Thanks everybody uh, for hanging out today. Uh, Matt, hopefully that answers your question. Hey, what's up? Uh, I've never had to say that name out loud before. Munditimum? Munditimum? Uh, is that right? I, I've replied to like a million of your comments, but I've never had to say your name out loud before. Hey, what's up, uh, Jeff? Great to see you here. Hey, what's up, Christian? All right, we'll move on to uh, question number four, topic number four in just a second. I highly recommend all of you go to tennissecret.com and go sign up. I'm, I'm about, to, I'm putting together, I'm actively working on putting together some new coaching and it's, it's going to be a live session and I'm just working on putting together all the material and putting together all the, the training right now. So this is, this is the first day, the first time that I've, that I've talked about it. Um, so the coaching's not ready yet, but I'm working on putting it together. So if you want to be the first person to, to engage with it and you want to be there live to ask me questions so I can help you be successful in your game. And if you want to learn how to win matches with half the running and half the like scrambling around and craziness and like just kind of making it up as you go, then go to tennissecret.com and go sign up totally free. And I uh, hope to see you uh, at that live training session when, when I'm ready, which is going to be really soon. I just wanted to give you all kind of the first opportunity to, uh, to check it out. So, so go check it out. All right. <clears throat> Question number four. <laughs> uh, no, there's no way I pronounced it. For, you're just, you're just trying to make me feel good. <laughs> what, uh, what nationality or what, uh, <clears throat> what background is that, is that name? It's out of curiosity. Or is it not like a real name? Is it just like a screen name? Yeah, yeah, you're welcome, Math. Yeah, no problem. <clears throat> Latin. So is it like a proper name or is it, uh, does it like mean, does it, I mean, I know it has like a meaning, you know, either way, but uh, interesting. Okay, uh, let's go on to uh, question number four here. Let's, let's keep, uh, keep the train rolling. Screen. Uh, Philosophy, oh, interesting. All right, next up. Next question comes to us from John. At what point in a match do you and your partner change strategies? End of a set, down a break? This is a million dollar question, John, and uh, I'm looking forward to answering this because I've been asked this question definitely hundreds of times over the years, making videos, doing podcasts. So I'm really looking forward to, uh, to breaking this down. So the, <laughs> the short answer is, not too soon and uh, not too late. <laughs> so jokes, obviously. But the, the reality, this is why it's tricky. The reality is there's like some give and take and there is like a best time, but we don't always know for sure when that best time is. But let me give you some guidelines that you can follow to be a little bit more accurate to picking out the right time. Because unfortunately, most tennis players fall kind of on either end of the extremes. Either at the first sign of trouble, like the first time they lose two or three points in a row, they're like, oh no, this is not working. I need to do something totally different. Like 
I'm an, I'm an aggressive baseliner, but I just lost three points, so I'm gonna start serving and volleying. Or, the, I feel like this is probably more common, is tennis players only really have one flavor, and no matter what's happening, even if it's like 0-6, you know, 0-5, they're still doing the exact same thing they were doing at 0-0 at the beginning of the match. So those are the two like extremes that we want to totally avoid. And there's a lot of gray. <laughs> there's a lot of gray in between. So how do we figure out when exactly the right uh, time is? Let's talk about it. So let's, first of all, lay some ground rules. Number one, never change a winning game plan, ever. And what does winning mean? It doesn't mean winning every point. All we need is 51% of the points to win a tennis match. In fact, it's possible, and this has happened, this happens all the time in, in tennis, you can win less than half of the points and still win the match just because of the, the like you just have to win the right points. So you don't even need half the points. But if you're at 51, 52, like 53% of the points, you're probably gonna win, but it can look dicey in there. Like there's an, a natural ebb and a natural flow to how the points kind of go back and forth. And there's, there's natural momentum shifts, even in a very close match. And like part of this is just being comfortable with that and realizing that there's gonna be pockets where you lose points in a close match, even in a match that you win. So you never change a winning game plan even if that means you're only winning half of the points, you're only winning you know, 50, 51% of the points. If you're losing, but it's close, then give it time because there's so many other variables at play besides just your strategy. So in other words, your tactical approach is just one variable out of many, many variables and you don't even control like a, a lot of them. So there's lots of things happening. There's lots of ups and downs and ebbs and flows. And if every time there's a, there's an ebb, you're like, oh crap, what do I do? Like, I got to do something different. Then you're just constantly going to be bouncing all around. So here's a bunch of things that can shift without you having anything to do with it. Your opponent's mental game can totally just go on tilt at a moment's notice. You, you just never know. And so if you just start losing a couple points and you totally change your tactics, it could have been five minutes from then if you just stuck with a thing that was like kind of keeping you nose and nose then eventually they might just blow up mentally and just totally self-destruct. Their fitness and conditioning, you never know when they might just kind of hit a wall. And the thing that was keeping you like just barely neck and neck with them, all of a sudden, boom, you just kind of take over in the match. Their execution and timing, even if they have a perfect strategy against you and you're just like barely staying even with them, there can be a lapse in concentration. There can be a lapse in their timing. There can be a lapse and how they're swinging the racket. And all of a sudden, you know, they just, they take their foot off the gas 5% because they're like, oh, what's going on? And the tactic that you stuck with totally takes over the match. How about your timing, your execution, your confidence? It's, it'd be nice to think that we totally control those things, but, but we don't. There's, there's ebbs and flows and all of those things that we can't just micromanage. Like there's gonna be some shifts in how we're doing that we to can't totally control. And how about conditions, like the weather, spectators, noise happening around the court? All of those things could contribute to helping your opponent play a little bit worse. We just don't know. And then big point outcomes. You hear tennis um, commentators all the time talking about how uh, he just won like the big points. Sometimes it's just a little bit of luck, honestly. You ever have a set where it's like every game goes to deuce? Everybody's had this set, right? Where every game goes to deuce and you lose every game. <laughs> and it's like, man, it was just that, it was like 1% and it's every game, you just barely got edged out. What well, you never know when those things might tip and all of these things, you never know when all of these things might tip or tilt in a little bit different direction. So this is why like if it's, if it's close, stick with the plan. If it's like 50-50, and you're, you feel solid about the approach you're taking, none of these things, like any kind of little bit of up and down shouldn't dissuade you and shouldn't cause you to jump ship because if it does, you're just gonna be chasing your tail and shifting your tactics like every, every minute, every two minutes, and there's no way to be successful that way consistently. So with, that, with, those, uh, with all those things in mind, here's my general suggestions. If there's one break of serve in a set, and there's a little bit of time left 
So it's like two to four, or it's like one to three, or it's zero to two, or you know something like that. One break of serve, and the points are like currently are like 50-50. It's like I win one, they win one, I win two, they win two, and it's just kind of like trading blows, like back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, and it, it's close. Then let it ride and just focus on your controllables. What are your controllables, by the way? This is all of them. You only really, truly control three things. Your efforts, your mental focus, like what it is that you're fixated on, like mentally from, from moment to moment. You can't control your thoughts, by the way. Like they're going to come and go, but you can control what you give energy to mentally. And finally, the quality of your intention. Notice I didn't say quality of execution. Quality of execution is going to go up and down, and, and we can't really control that. But we can control our quality of intention. How much margin for error am I giving myself? What are the patterns that I'm sticking to? Am I sticking to my game plan or am I just bouncing all over the place? These are the only three things that you actually fully control during a tennis match. If you can think of any others, feel free to tell me in the, in the comments down below. These, these are the only things that you fully control. You have influence over other stuff, but you can't actually control what happens outside of these things. So if it's close, then let it ride and see what happens and just focus on your controllables. Now, here's the thing. On the other hand, if it's more than one break, so here's your three criteria. If it's more than one break and or, so it might be either or, it's close to the end of the set or the match. So it's like, you know, it's two breaks and it's, it's, uh, it's five, two probably time to mix it up and or it's close. It's not, I'm sorry. It's not close to 50, 50 points. So you're, you're only winning like two out of every 10 points. And especially if you combine these. So if it's like, it's two breaks, it's close to the end of the set and you're only winning like two out of 10 points. You've probably waited too long. Any one of these is enough of a reason to change it. But if you start combining them, if it's close to the end of the, the match and you're only, even, even, if it's, um, even if it's only one break. So let's say it's one break of serve, it's close to the end of the match and you're only winning like two out of the, like the last 10 points, you've only won two of them. It's, uh, like you, we, we gotta make something happen here. Like we're running out of time. So use these three criteria. If all three are present, it's probably too late. If two are present, you probably, it's probably time to, to change things up and try something different. If one is present, but it's like really strong and solid, then start to consider changing it. Does that, does that make sense? So that's how I want you to think about these things. And your focus uh, next should go to what's the next most apparent pattern or swing or target, like weakness on the other side that I can exploit and pivot to that as being my primary focus. So that's when you want to think about actually changing your tactics. The bottom line is use these. These are general suggestions. Okay. Like it's not, there's not a magic formula here. These are ground rules. Pay attention to what's working and what doesn't and understand that it takes time to build basically like a competitive intuition where a you're aware of those things. Like you're, you're staying present and like you're actually, you have your wits about you enough to actually notice whether or not these things are happening. And once you check those boxes, you can actually develop this as a skill. And you start to kind of develop a sixth sense about when should I shift and when shouldn't I? Is it too early to change tactics or it's ways it's too late? Like, and I, I'm already kind of out of control here and I, I don't really have a chance of going back and, and getting, you know, back into the match. Hopefully that all makes sense. I know this is a little bit abstract. Like I can't, I can't give you like an exact answer, right? Like that, that's why this is tricky because I can't say after you've lost your second point in a row and there's one break of serve and it's the second Tuesday of the month and you're wearing black, then change tactics. Like there's, there's no like <laughs> specific like prescription I can give you. You, you have to feel it out, but these are the different elements that you should be paying close attention to. All right, one more uh, topic here. I'm looking forward to this one a lot. I'm pretty sure, 
Lorbat, I'm pretty sure Mark is not uh, picky. That's why he eats at Taco Bell. I'm pretty sure he eats everything at Taco Bell. But uh, but I, I I could be wrong. I don't think he's like super discriminatory <laughs> of the uh, the Taco Bell menu. Yeah, if you haven't found anything that you like on the Taco Bell menu so far, that, that's don't feel like you're doing it wrong. It's okay. <laughs> nice, Dirk. Yeah, that's uh Mark's favorite order at Taco Bell is the uh is the excuses supreme. Yeah, I like that. That's what Mark gets at, at Taco Bell. That's his that's his uh his out for when he loses matches. All right. <clears throat> Let's go to our fifth topic here. Final topic. Thanks everybody for hanging out today. I appreciate it. Hope uh, you're learning something. Getting some ideas. This topic comes to us from Hunter. He wrote in and said, how can I improve my running to the net volleys? Okay, so I see this is a huge problem area for tennis players, Hunter. I'm really glad you asked this question because it's a really important topic. And I actually have some footage right now from a recent student, actually the, the last student that I worked with I'm going to show you, that is just a perfect illustration of, of what not to do. So I'm not, I'm not trying to like call this student out. It's just, I see this all the time, constantly, and this is just the, the most recent example. So let's take a look at this. And the thing, the theme here we're gonna be talking about is prioritizing closeness over balance or preparedness. So let's, uh, let's take a look. And you're gonna be paying attention here to uh, the player and right over here is my student. I'm just getting ready to put up a serve or a toss uh, for a serve over on the other side. So that's what's happening. I'm gonna go ahead and play the point and I'll let you see what happens first. Approaching that. And whoop, forgot about the ball. <laughs> now, in fairness, this is a kind of an extreme you know, scenario. This is kind of an extreme uh, example, but that's what makes it a perfect Example, that's what, that's what makes it a perfect illustration. So let's break this down. So this player is hitting this ball, deciding to come to the net. Now what we're gonna look for specifically here is what his feet are doing right around when I make contact with the ball. We're gonna go a little bit past contact here just to make it apples to apples when we look at a pro example in a second. And so I'm getting ready for the, the passing shot. I'm hitting right now. So when I'm hitting, I want you to look at the position that my student's feet are in. And now we're gonna inch forwards a little bit, past contact. So he just landed from that stride. The ball's just coming off my racket. And so the ball's on its way now, and he's just taken another stride, and another stride, and another stride, and he just kind of ran right past the ball. Now, again, like in fairness, like this is kind of an extreme, you know, he probably thought this was like maybe hitting the net or it was gonna be a net court or something. He just kind of missed it. But this footwork pattern is exactly what happens that gives players trouble. So we're, we're gonna leave the video right here. So the ball is already off my racket. And so I want you to look at my student, okay? So this is how not to do it. And now we're gonna go over to a professional example. Let's take a look at the Bryan brothers. So this is gonna be a serve and volley from Bob on this side. And we're gonna look at the same pattern here. So he hits his serve, immediately come forward, comes forwards into the court. Now here's the hit. The ball just came off of the racket of the returner. So here's the return right here. And I want you to watch Bob, what position are his feet in immediately after that return gets hit? This position right here is called a ready position. So he's widening his feet. By the way, look at his brother up at the net. Both of them are in a wide stance. So what he's not doing here is running forwards. The reason is he doesn't know until after he hits this split step whether or not the ball is going this way or this way or it's going to be a drop shot, or it's going to be a lob over Mike's head. Like, he has no idea what's going to happen to the ball. He has a pretty good idea based on, you know, he's obviously an incredible athlete, and he's got good anticipation, but he doesn't know for sure. So he's making a split step here, and he's balancing himself, even though he's only one step inside the baseline. 
Think about that for a second. All he's done here is hit his serve and taken one step after landing from his serve and he goes into a split step. It's because he doesn't know where the ball is going and he needs to be ready to go anywhere. So he balances himself, pushes in the direction of the ball, sets himself up, hits this volley, and I want you to watch how he repeats that. So he's gonna move forwards to the net. He's just inside the service line now, which is still for most tennis players really far back. He's gonna take one more step forwards and then make another split step right here. And so you can see here how Bob and Mike are perfectly synced. They're perfectly together at the exact same instant, getting prepared and ready because they don't know if it's a lob, they don't know if it's a passing shot, they don't know if it's going middle, if it's going angle, if it's going down the line, they don't know. And so they're balancing themselves. Now, here's the thing. These are world-class, like some of the best doubles players of all time, like ever, right? And they're still going to the trouble of balancing themselves every single time the ball gets hit on the other side. And so contrast that with, again, with my student, like just for, just for contrast here, not to like laugh at them or make fun of them, but this is what's normal. This is what's normal for tennis players is hit the passing shot. And what my student is really doing here is he's saying, I need to get as close as I can to the net because if I don't get close to the net, I don't feel confident in my volleys. So I'm gonna get in as far as I possibly can. And so when I hit, he's actively running and that's why he never gets balanced or set and he just runs right past the ball. So this is absolutely crucial. As long as you prioritize closeness over balance, you're going to struggle transitioning up to the net. The pro example is totally different because they're prioritizing balance over closeness. You just saw um, Bob Bryan split step one step inside the baseline. He's saying, I don't, I don't care. Like I just need to be ready for whatever is about to come next. So why would they, why would they do that when they actually have less time? Well, that's actually, it's kind of answers the question, right? Like the ball is moving much faster. So wouldn't it be better for Bob and Mike to just like get in as close as possible? Well, no, because if they're not in a balanced position, the ball is moving so much faster for them. Like if my student can run past my 20 mile an hour or 30 mile an hour like passing shot, uh, if you've got, you know, uh, Leander Pays on the other side of the net hitting a 90 mile an hour forehand, you better be in a ready position. And so I think normal tennis players, like non-elite professional tennis players, just feel the urgency or need of like, ah, I got to get up there or else I'm kind of stranded. But the reality is you have to take your time and, and get balanced. So the bottom line is the pros prioritize balance over closeness. They know that poor preparation is going to be a disaster if they're close. If Bob and Mike just run forwards and they get super, super close, but they're not balanced, that's a disaster at their level. There's no time to respond. And so if they shoot themselves in the foot further by like being in mid stride when an opponent hits the ball, there's no chance. The vast majority of tennis players do not split step. Even those of you watching right now who are like, oh yeah, like I know about this. Like I've been told to split step a million times. You probably don't split step either. <laughs> and I'm just saying this based on my experience of doing thousands of lessons and clinics and like tens of thousands of hours on the court with everyday tennis players. Even if you think you split step, you're probably not. Or if you are, your timing, you know, isn't precise. And so you're leaving, you're, st you're still not as balanced as you should be. So if you want more coaching on this, do a search on YouTube for essential tennis split step. We've got a whole bunch of lessons on it. It's absolutely critical. It starts with this. Don't even think about volley technique when you're coming into the net until you get yourself balanced first. You can practice your technique like all day with a ball machine and that's great and you're going to feel fantastic and it's, you're going to feel super confident. You're going to feel like, oh man, I'm the best volleyer ever. And then in real life, if you skip the split step, all that practice and training totally goes out the window. It's totally useless because you put yourself in a compromised position. So Hunter, hopefully that makes sense. We're going to split step, brother. It's, uh, it's the most important part of this. Uh, hopefully this is helpful uh, to everybody. All five topics today. Uh, appreciate it. If, uh, if you're watching this, you want me to answer your question, then just leave it in the comments, not in the live chat. I know there's a bunch of you uh, watching in the live chat uh, right now. Uh, 
And I know there's a couple questions in the live chat as well. Um, but I have to sign off for today. I'm at my time limit. So just leave any questions in the comments, not the live chat, but the comments as soon as this video um, publishes. And I'll do my best to answer it in a future lesson. In the meantime, make sure to go to tennissecret.com. Sign up for that training where you'll learn three secrets to winning twice as many matches with half the running. And that's, that's not like clickbait. Like Literally, you can win way more matches running half as much. So if that sounds good to you, definitely go to tennissecret.com. I'm putting the finishing touches on that. It's not ready yet, but you can, you can be the first person in line uh, to check that out. So uh, thanks, everybody, for joining me today. Uh, Manditamum, uh, Math, Lorbat, Dirk, uh, Christian, Jeff Lewis, lots of people in the chat today. Thank you so much. Really appreciate your support. Thanks for watching. Hopefully you learned something today, got some new ideas. I'll talk to you in the next session. Take care.